well, you know, I went to hell without a PhD, and uh, but in my mind, I always wanted one, and uh, and to be in a medical school without so-called credentials was kind of difficult. So when I went to hell, I decided that uh, I would uh, try to get a PhD, uh, even though I knew it would be difficult. Well, one of the things I had done before I left NIH was uh, helped Southern Illinois University in Carbondale, Illinois, to get a graduate program in microbiology. So after, after I sit, I was decided, how could I get a PhD and still you know, work at the same time? So I called a friend of mine back at Southern Illinois, Ike Schechmeister, and ask him what would I have to do to get a PhD from Southern Illinois. And he said, well, let me talk to my chairman and, and I'll get back to you. So he, so he did and he called me back and said, well, Warren, I talked to the chairman and we've agreed that what we would do was to take uh, your credits from Georgetown and, and your publications to make to show that you you are certified to get a PhD in microbiology, and I was elated by that. I said, "Well, this is really great." And he said, "Well, you know, well, there's one thing that they won't waive." And I said, "Really, what's that?" He said, well, "They require that if you get a PhD from Illinois, you have to spend one year in full-time residency in Carbondale." They won't waive that. That's that's the state law. And I said, well, let me go talk to Dr. Mann and see what he thinks about it. So I went to Dr. Mann and told him I was going to leave for a year to go to Illinois to get a PhD. And his response was, Warren, you, I, I didn't hire you because of uh, your background in, in academia. I hired you on the basis of, of, of your reputation and your administrative skills. So if you leave, what's going to happen to all the things we had planned here at Howard? I said, Dr. Man, that's kind of hard because I always wanted a PhD, not because I needed one, I just wanted one. So he said, well, think about it and let me know what you're going to do. So I decided, you know, I realized that, that I owed Howard an, a, a, an allegiance to, to fulfill my commitment to help them develop a research program. So, so I stayed. And, and uh, it was a blessing in disguise that I did because uh, there were certain things that I had to do here, here in Washington that I couldn't have done back in Carbondale. One was to take care of my mother, who was getting along in age. And it turned out because the medical school in Howard is only about five minutes from where my mother lived. If she needed to see a physician, all she had to do was call me and say, Warren, I need to see Dr. So-and-so. And five minutes, I would be at her house and get in care to the doctor. If I had gone to Carbondale, I couldn't have done that. So that's one blessing in disguise. Well, anyway, the, the way I got a PhD was that uh, I, I got an appointment uh, when I went to Howard as a, in microbiology, uh, working with the with a man named Willie Turner, who who the one who got who got me there in the first place, and I helped Willie write a, a protocol to establish a PhD program in microbiology in the medical school. So Willie said, Warren, what you need to do is that that while you're worried about going back to Georgetown and going to Carbondale, you can apply for a PhD right here in our department. So that meant what I could do was I could work during the day, uh, take courses at night toward the PhD in microbiology and be finished in about a year or two. So they said, mm -hmm. he lied. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> so, so I enrolled in the Department of Microbiology in 1976 as, as a PhD student and wearing still my title as a dean in, in microbiology. It was interesting dynamics, you can imagine. So the question came with how would I be able to do a dissertation 
since I had been out of the laboratory for about 13 years, had not picked the pipette up, had not done any experiments at all, I wasn't sure. And when I did that, if I could really do a dissertation, because in doing research, it means that the coordination between eye and hand tells you whether you, your experiments work well or not. So I had some friends back at NIH that I called and, and asked them would they, they give me some of the supplies I need to practice doing experiments. So I practiced for about two months, just pipetting and, and titrating virus to make sure I could do it. And after about two months of doing this at night, I became convinced that I could, you know, could do it pretty well. Well, the question came now with this, what would I work on? Well, everything works for good, no matter how it is. But it turns out that what, what the good that I, that I got out of this was the fact that, uh, that Howard had a, a, in dermatology, a man named Jack Kinney, who had about 500 patients that had vitiligo. And we, got, we went, met with a, with a guy named Perry Mitchell, a congressman from Maryland, to discuss how we could establish a, a consortium to study vitiligo under sponsorship of NIH. Well, they said the budget had already been appropriated, so they had no extra money to, to do this. So what they suggested is that why don't you get together, rather than trying to have a program at Harvard, and, I'm sorry, Yale, and a program at Howard, form a consortium comprised of Howard, Yale, Bryn Mawr, and University of Massachusetts to study vitiligo. Well, the thing about vitiligo is that, uh, that you yeah, just don't study it, you have to understand the, the history of the disease. It's an old disease. And for years, uh, it was confused with leprosy. And during the Exodus, when, uh, when, when Moses and Miriam were, were leave, leaving in, the, in going through the wilderness, uh, Moses' brother Aaron and his sister Miriam attacked him. Well, God didn't like that too much. So what he did, he struck. Miriam with leprosy, and so they the the, the progress through the through the through the, the wilderness had to had to be stopped for a while until her leprosy cleared up. So I said, well, maybe she didn't have leprosy. What she had was vitiligo, because vitiligo could be treated, you know, in in a way. And the reason for that is that the Jews came out of, out of Egypt and the, the, the pharaohs had vitiligo. Uh, so whenever a pharaoh showed up with a white spot on his face that, that did not repigment, he would send his physicians down to the bank of the Nile to gather a plant called Sorolea Sorolea. And it wasn't until 1946 when another physician, Egyptian physician named El Mofti, found out what was the active component of, of, in this plant called Soril Sorolea that helped cure, cure vitiligo. Well, they found out what it was. It, it was what it was. It was like a, uh, uh, they, well, the way they do it, they, they would uh, paint the pharaoh's face you know, with, uh, with some of the ornament. Denard from from Sorolo and Sorolia, and nothing would happen until they, they set him in the sunlight, and the activation of the sunlight activated the, the drug so that they got repigmented. Well, he applied that that method method of treatment for vitiligo. So that's part of the history behind how it, it got to be there. So what I decided to do was uh, was that. Uh, I didn't just decide, it turned out by accident that, uh, that, that I even thought about doing a dissertation on vitiligo. Uh, when, we, when we met with the Yale administration, uh, we would meet in, different, meet in different cities. And one night, I was in Philadelphia 
with Jack Kinney and the chairman of Yale's Department of Dermatology having dinner. In the course of the dinner, they were discussing, you know, how vitiligo expressed itself. And, and Aaron, Aaron Little said, said to, to Jack Kinney, said, you know, I've never seen a vitiligo patient with acne. And I, I just listened, you know, because I was, I'm not a dermatologist, so I said, well, let me see what, what question I can ask. So I decided to ask a question. I said to them, have you ever seen a vitiligo patient with herpes simplex? And, uh, and they didn't answer me right away. Uh, they kept going on. And about 10 minutes later, Aaron said to me, he said, Warren, I've been thinking about your question. I've never seen a vitiligo patient with herpes simplex. And I said, man, that's something, because herpes is one of the most ubiquitous of all the viruses we know of. It infects up to 90% of the world's population. And uh, some of it can be clinically apparent, some of it is not. So I came back to Washington and did some preliminary experiments uh, just to see what I could find out. I tested about 20 people to see what, you know, who had vitiligo to see if they had uh, antibody against herpes simplex type 1, uh, which was the, the marker for that. And, uh, and I, I decided after going through that that, that, that was a, a, a doable thesis. So I interviewed with the department, went through the, oh, had to go through, getting a PhD is not something that, uh, that just happens. Uh, they, the people who have PhDs, Guarded like it's their life. They want to make sure that if you get a PhD, that you earn it. So uh, what they did is the, they I went through had, had to make a presentation before the uh, before the the faculty committee uh, or oral presentation, and to show them that I was proficient in my knowledge of microbiology and everything else. They never asked me a single question about herpes. They asked me a question about everything else in microbiology. And uh, after the exam was over with, I left, I, was, I went to the left, left Washington and, and went down to Camp AP Hill in, in, in Virginia to work with the Boy Scouts. Well, when I left, when they, I, I figured, well, now I'm, waiting, I'm ready to be now admitted to candidacy for the PhD. I got back home. My wife said that they were trying to find me because they, they, they asked me to just prepare an abstract of what my, what my research would be. And I gave them just that, an abstract. They called my home while I was gone and said that my abstract was not sufficient, that they wanted more than that. So I said, well, what do you want? We said, you, you, you write, tell us what your dissertation is going to contain. So what I did, I said, okay, if, uh, if you don't accept my abstract, I'll write a whole, I wrote a hundred pages <laughs> sitting on, the, uh, on my bed in, in my living room and, and dictated it. A hundred pages of, of that, that, that would form the, the, the content of my dissertation. And I gave that, I said, is this enough? And they said, yeah, this is just what we want. I said, well, that's not what you asked for. I'm going to give it to you anyway. So what would happen is that, uh, that uh, I was not yet admitted to candidacy because I had to still show that, uh, that, I, that, that, that I was, uh, you know, capable of doing something else. So uh, my, my wife decided that, that year that for Christmas she would buy, buy me an academic robe that, that's a Ph.D. gown. Uh, the PhD is in microbiology is 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 is, is, is identified by Staphylococcus aureus. It had Staphylococcus aureus produces a gold pigment, so my robe was lined in gold down the front. I mean, it was a uh, if if you saw how commencement and people march in, the faculty march in. You could pick me out of the crowd because I had this gold robe on. It's the only one on the campus you had. So, so I went on, I went on then and, and uh, I, I, they kept putting off everything, you know, doing, you know, giving me, admitting me to candidacy. 
So I got mad one day and said, I said, look, I've given you everything you asked for. I've taken all the courses you told me to take. I've done every single thing you asked me to do. And I'm not taking this anymore. I'm going to go see the dean. And, uh, and Willie, of course, was up. He said that, well, Warren, I went, you know, it's just a matter. We want to make sure that you earn this PhD, that you're not just giving it to us. I said, well, that may be well and good, but, uh, but I've, I, I've done all this stuff, and still, I'm not admitting to candidacy. So we made an appointment to see the dean, and, uh, and we went to graduate school, and uh, we went in and sat down and talked to this professor, who was the associate dean, and he said, well, 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 I thought you were already a doctor. I said, no, people presumed I had one, but, but I, I wanted to make sure that I've earned this, that not something that people just done this. So he said, well, what do you, have you got something to show that you can, can do a dissertation? I pulled this 100 pages out and said, yeah, here's my, here's my perspective for my, you know, for my dissertation. He said, my God, man, you know, you've done enough for about, about two PhDs. <laughs> so uh, he, he decided that, that you've done enough and we're going to admit you the candidacy. That's the process. You have to be admitted to candidacy before you can even think about getting a degree. So he scheduled the, the, my, my oral defense on August the 5th of 1984. And... Taria was Taria's birthday was April the fifth, and uh, before then there had been no other PhDs awarded by Howard at that time. At that time, so I I took my only son uh, Bobby uh, sat across from me and heard me defend my dissertation along with everybody. Because you just say, what happens, they get you in a room like this, and the, the examining the committee and it makes you, you give a presentation describing the essence of your dissertation, and then they tell everybody to leave, that then they will question you about the detail. You have to defend the dissertation. So, so I, everybody wanted, wanted, wanted to attend, and, and, and they asked me, well, do you mind if, if everybody who comes here, they listen to it, stay? I said, I, let them all stay here. And everybody come, they can all come, they can listen to everything. So my son Bobby sat across from me and heard me defend My dissertation, and uh, and it, the exam lasted about an hour or so, and then they they made everybody leave. They go then they would vote as to whether I, I had really, you know, done enough to show proficiency in the discipline. So I had made my mind up that day, either I was going to be a doctor or I was going to shoot somebody. <laughs> So I left the room and went outside, and, they, and then Willie came out and said, uh, and he shook my hand and said, well, Dr. Ashton, you know, I want to let you know that you have been just, you have completed the requirements for the PhD. And I said, Willie, it's a good thing you said Dr. Ash, because you had said something else. We were going to rumble, hey, we really, and I meant, I meant it. Well, and it turned out that, that, uh, that, that I wrote my thesis on, on vitiligo. That that's what, what, what it was. It was just it, it was a a labor of love, you might say. That uh, I learned more than I can imagine about something that I didn't know anything all about. Uh, vitiligo was what Michael Jackson suffered from. Uh, he had what they call segmental vitiligo. His hands were spotted, you might say. And what he decided to do, that rather than getting repigmented, he got depigmented. And there's a, there's a drug that you use to, to, to cause depigmentation. And so what he did, he, he, he had generalized with the LIGO. 
as, as, as a part of that. So that, that's one other, other thing. Another kind of vitiligo was acrofacial vitiligo. It occurred around, around, around the, 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 the mouth and the face. It was segmental, acrofacial, and generalized with three, kind of three classes of vitiligo. And depending upon you know, what, how, how much you have will be what, what the physicians will, will treat you for. Most people are treated for acrofacial vitiligo. Uh, vitiligo is, is more prevalent than, uh, than, than people can imagine in the population because what it is is that there's a whole industry in this country made of, of, of cosmetics that help hide the spots of a vitiligo patient. Well, I had a whole, uh, I had the IRB go through the whole review of, of, of my protocol and, uh, and I, I, I would interview patients and ask them what serious event occurred prior to the appearance of the vitiligo spots. And, and to a man or a woman, as you might say, uh, most of the time, vitiligo occurs as a result of a stressful life event, like the death of a spouse, uh, uh, you know, being married, mixed mix up. Every patient I interviewed said that, that they had gone through a, a life-changing experience before vitiligo appeared. So that, that was the, uh, the basis for it, and it was all approved by the IRB which was uh, rather, rather interesting, you might say, to do it because I was in charge of the IRB. <laughs> and, 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 and I, I would, uh, I, you know, I, I, I enjoyed working with the IRB. When I went to Howard, one of the charges that Dr. Mann gave me was to clean up the mess involving human subjects or human research. Uh, the NIH, we had the responsibility to, to write the assurances, have institutions write the assurances, but the Food and Drug Administration had the responsibility to enforce the, 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 the assurances. So when the Tuskegee study broke in 1971, uh, one of the things that uh, Ted Kennedy did when he mandated that they be an establishment of institutions who receive federal funds who have a duty constituted IRB, they would be, they had to have it, certain characteristics along with it. Well, one of my responsibilities at Howard was they were to clean that mess up. When I first went there, uh, that there, there, was, there was no IRB of a, that, that function. They were a bunch of, uh, I, say, I say, you know, middle-aged men who sat around and philosophized. They didn't do anything. So, what I did, uh, exercising my power as, a, as, an, as an assistant dean, I, I decided that I would disband that committee and form a new one. And what I did is that I, I got rid of that committee and then formed a committee called the Human Research Review Committee that was uh, charged with responsibility to review all the human research in the College of Medicine and to write reports and keep records straight Know, to comply with, with, with the regulations. Well, when, the, when, when Tuskegee broke, uh, uh, F, the FDA decided that they would you know, visit 100 institutions to see whether they were compliant with, with the federal requirements for IRBs. So when they decided to come to Howard, they talked to the president and told them that they wanted to come to Howard to interview members of the IRB. Well, there was no IRB. So the president called Dr. Mann and said, look, uh, I know you got a committee in the College of Medicine that reviews human research. Uh, let it be the IRB. Uh, the, 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 the dean went to the vice president and did this, and then the vice president came to me and said, Warren, you are the IRB. Well, the, the guy from the Food and Drug Administration came in my office one day and knocked on the door, very polite, and he read me my rights. He had a badge, man, and he put that badge in my face and said, you have the right to remain silent, like Miranda, you know, thing. And I said, man, you know, what are you talking about? I, you know, I didn't want to tell him I was not the 
the chairman of the IRB. I said, okay, well, I'll interview you. So he interviewed me for two days. He searched my records, uh, looked at everything. And after two days, you know, we were wind up the exit interview. He said, well, he said, well, D. Lash, you know, I'm, I'm going to tell you that this, you have good records. You have done well. And I'm pleased to tell you that my report will show and reflect this. Well, I felt real good by that time. I said, man, you know, this is, we're home free now. But he said, before I leave, let me ask you one more question. And he reached in his briefcase and he pulled a, a, a document out and said, when's the last time that your board has reviewed this protocol? And what it was was a protocol of minoxidil. You know, it was, minoxidil was to treat baldness, I guess it was. And what had happened, three years before I went to Howard, there was a study conducted in the Department of Medicine with minoxidil, and there was an adverse reaction, and the patient died. The law required that when you have an adverse reaction, you report it to the Food and Drug Administration, and they have to initiate an investigation to make sure it does not recur. And you have to also institute annual reviews of the protocol. So I said, well, to tell you the truth, I don't know anything about this because I, you know, I wasn't even at Howard at that time. He said, well, nevertheless, you're responsible. I said, man, you know, you know this, this is not what I asked for because you, you, you may, and I was really upset with that kind of talk. Well, so I, I said, well, okay, what I'll do, I will initiate a review immediately to get back in compliance, the annual review. And I did, and, and we reviewed it and, and found that the protocol was, was, was deactivated, that, that no more subjects were enrolled after that, that, that time, and nor would any more be enrolled until they went through annual reviews. So he said, uh, when he left, he said, well, I'm going to tell you that, uh, that I've, I, I have looked at a number of institutions, and yours is one of the best that I've, I've looked at in all this review. So I, I felt you know, you know, pretty, pretty, pretty good about that. But uh, my career at Howard has been one that, uh, that is, is, to tell you the truth, is something that, you, you know, it, it's hard to explain to someone who was not a part of it. What it was like to go to an institution that did not have the resources that most of the major schools had and to be given responsibilities to build something from scratch and shape it and form it in such a way that it could, it could be competitive any place. So uh, I stayed in Howard 45 years. Uh, I went there to stay five years because I said if I went there, I would, stay, I would never work in another institution more than five years because the, what, the reason for that is that when I was at NIH, uh, I would have people that come to my, my lab and, and, and I would train them. They would stay three years and leave, and every time they left, they got a job, you know, in industry, they got big, you know, big jobs and everything. So I decided I would stay at Howard five years. Well, five years came and, uh, and I was still there. Then pretty soon, 10 years was a part of it. And then 20 years, and before I knew it, my whole career was spent at, at Howard, almost you know, in, in, in working to, to do, th do things. I was able to to do things for Howard that, that nobody else could have done because of my knowledge of NIH and, and what NIH did. What I did is that, uh, that uh, I, I, one of the hallmarks of an academic institution is whether you have a general clinical research center. And a GCRC is, means you, have, you conduct clinical research on a controlled environment. One of the requirements to get a GCRC, you just don't apply for it, you have to meet certain specific requirements to apply to NIH to get that kind of money. They require that you have to have at least seven federally funded research, research grants in, in the institution. You have to have a functional IRB 
and you have to show that you can continue you have access to a number of patients to, to justify your utilization of it. So what I did is that, uh, that uh, I, 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 I just, I probably killed myself doing this, I guess, because uh, I had to write that grant. And it, it was about 300 pages long. And when, when, when I wrote it, uh, it, it was during the, hol during the holidays, because that's when I, I did most of my work. I would work over holidays, any, any, anything at all. And what happened uh, that that weekend? DC was was hit with a, with, a, with an ice storm, and the whole city was shut down. Well, the humorous part of this, you know, if, if, if you allow me to share this with you, uh, I had been asked to to go to New York. To, to take part in Montel Williams' show, and uh, and so I got, I asked them, could, could I bring my wife, and my daughter? They said, sure, you can bring anybody, you know. But so we we get there, so we we, we went to went, went to New York and uh, and uh, got there and had and they had they had uh, you know the this limousine picked us up at the airport, you know, and drove us to. To the hotel. Well, I knew from the beginning that something must have been wrong with this because the the whole this man who was who was driving the limousine couldn't find the hotel. So I said, "Well, the hotel is back over there." So we 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 finally got there. So we went we get lined up to be interviewed by Montel Williams. Uh, Tuskegee was still very much in people's minds, you might say, at that time. So uh, Montel came out, well, he, he shook my hand, you know, and everything. He said, so, so you're Dr. Ashton. Well, well, the saying goes, I was, I was hooked, man. I had, had my wife and, and my daughter, man, had, had dressed me up to really to be on television. And Montel, you know, came out, boy, he didn't, he shook everybody's hand but mine. I mean, he was, he was, to, to use a phrase, he was an ass. He really was. And so I said, well, okay, if that's what you want to do. Well, uh, so we came out and wait, waited for, you know, the interviews to take place, waiting for our, our, our chance to come out and talk. So if the guy sitting next to me had never said a word the whole time that we, that we were in the hotel, and uh, Montel, you know, being the moderator, said, well, tell him, ask this guy, See, I understand that you are an AIDS researcher. And he said, no, I just read, read documents to justify this. And he, and he said, well, tell us about your experience with AIDS. He said, well, AIDS was created by white people to get rid of black people. And I said, what? Man, that's not true. And, and, uh, and, and of course, he, 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 got, he said that I was a... a, 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 a to use the phrase, a house nigger. They, they brought me there to make it sound like it was clean. So he cussed me out. We almost had a riot, man. Cosette got mad. Grace told him, you can't talk to my husband that way, man. And, and uh, he said, I don't give a damn about your husband. Man. You know, he, he, and she, <laughs> it was just a mess. So Montel got to me and, and asked me, well, Dr. Ash, tell me, what do you have? What is your opinion? When I started to explain to him about how microorganisms are selective in terms of what they do, he said, nobody's talking about that, that doctor mumbo jumbo stuff. You, you know, we don't want to hear all that stuff. Well, I said, well, okay, well, that's it. And so I didn't say anything else. We left and, uh, and came back to Washington. Well, as a, that was when, when, that, when we went there, that was that weekend of the ice storm. Well, one, one day, I guess after that, I was going through a giant in downtown Washington, and everybody in Washington must have seen that show, that, the, the thing. And a woman at 9th and O Street said, said to me, he said, yeah, I would have kicked his ass if it been me. <laughs> And they said, this is, the, this is the guy who was on Montel Williams' show, man. It, it was, uh, you know, it was, to me, it was just, just 
simply how much people react to things they want. So uh, Montel Williams' brother was the producer of the show, and we got back to Washington. He called me and said that, and apologized for Montel Williams' behavior. And I told him, I said, well, think about it. You lost an opportunity using your show to educate our people as to what was really happening in this country, and you blew it. He said, well, maybe you'll come back again. I said, hell no, n never again. And I have not done a tele television show since then. But it was a, uh, an experience that I thought was worthwhile, worthwhile doing. Uh, the IRB, and of course, that's what Prima is all about, uh, is something that I, I took great pride in in uh, working at Howard. Uh, I became the executive secretary of it because nobody else wanted, wanted to do the work. So I set, I set the agendas for all the meetings, kept all the minutes. I hired the lady who was the IRB administrative assistant. And, and that was an additional responsibility. I wasn't paid to be a member of the IRB. I was paid to be a, an associate dean in the College of Medicine. The IRB was the institutional program. So I worked all those years, 20, 25 years, I, I worked in the IRB. Uh, we met every first and third, third Wednesday at 3.30. At 3 uh, we would review all the protocols involving human, human, human participants for the whole university. So it was kind of a heavy responsibility, you might say. Uh, I, I believe that a part of my problem now is that I didn't know how to say no. And uh, my wife always told me, said, you say no to everybody but me. That if they ask me to do something to me, if, if, I, if it was my commitment, you know, I would do it. So, so, so I just took on more and more responsibility, more and more responsibility to almost to make sure that Howard would never be caught as being in, in, in an embarrassing situation. I, I became a, uh, a consultant for the, the Human Research Protection, Protection Program down, down, down in, 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 in the uh, in the gut for the government. Uh, they, would, they would send me off for site visits to visit places, you know, and I would evaluate them. Uh, I, I, I <laughs> we went to Southern, Southern, Southern went to, to, to Chicago to review a, uh, a, their research program, and there's certain things you had to do to be in compliance with the regulations. And we shut that institution down. And the lady who was the, uh, the, the, the associate provost had asthma. That woman had an asthmatic attack when, <laughs> when we read the results of what the problem, problems were there. Uh, so, I, so I became, they, were, they wanted somebody to go on a site visit someplace. They, they would call me and I would go. Uh, we went, to, uh, went to, to, to Los Angeles to review the Charles Drew University's IRB. And, we met in, you know, pre, the, the, before we went to them and talked to them, and uh, and and we decided that that they were going to be shut down. So I told Dave Caron, the guy from uh, from from the Office of Human Research Protection, that uh, that if we shut down Drew. Can you imagine having Jesse Jackson, Maxine Waters? And all these people standing on the steps of, 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 in Sacramento about how the federal government has shut down one of the two medical schools, three medical schools in this country because of noncompliance, and they were shut down by this black guy, Warren Ash, and this black woman, Mary Secundi from, from Tuskegee, you know, as a part of the state visit team. So I asked him, I said, tell you what we'll do. Uh, it's not our job really to make sure there is a protection of human participants, not so much to just shut things down and say, is there some other way we can do this without shutting them down? 
They said, well, yeah, it is. I said, well, why don't we do this? Why don't we give them two letters and let them decide what they wanted to do? So what we, what we did, they said, we'll do it if you call Dave Satcher back in Washington and let him know that we were doing it. So I, I said, okay. So I got that morning real early, called Washington, and luckily enough, that day, Dave was in his office when I called him. And I said, well, Dave, I tell you, we're out here at, uh, at Drew doing a site visit for, of the IRB, and there is a threat to shut down Drew. And I'm going to inform you that that's what's going to happen, so you won't be blindsided by any newspaper reports. And he said, okay, Warren, I'm informed. And he hung up. So, so we went to Drew and, uh, and met with the administration and, and gave them these two, two letters. One was to shut them down. One was with them to agree to voluntarily suspend IRB operations until they have a review, a thorough review of their program to bring it back in compliance. They chose to select the latter. Well, well uh, after I left, they, they told me that, uh, that, <laughs> that I had saved the university because if, if we had shut them down, even their, their, their work, their clinical work, would have to also shut down because the, the hospital depended upon the IRB to make it sure it was in compliance with the federal regulations. And, you know, so, so somehow or another, this whole process you know, of, of dealing with, with people is that there are, there are certain things that happen that you don't understand. Uh, there is a feeling, at least in my mind, that, uh, and I believe this most sincerely, that God has a plan for everybody. And he works that plan according to his standards, not ours. He moves in a mysterious way. And if you distrust him and believe in him, everything that you want in life, every desire you have will be fulfilled. And I believe that. I believe that uh, that uh, that I'm one of these people who that God has touched. in a very special way, mainly because everything that I put my hand to, to accomplish, I have. Everything, every dream that I have, you know, growing up, every hope I had in my heart has come true, even to the extent even to the extent of taking the criticism of people who didn't understand the fact that uh, those who are believers operate on a level of faith that differs from that of other people. And I think that I'm one of these folk that, who is different enough to believe that God does not make any mistakes. And I really believe that in my heart. Anything that that I, I have done in life has been because I've been blessed by the Almighty with a good family, a, a good wife. Uh, I didn't have as many children as my wife wanted to have. She wanted to have 12. Uh, we, we made it to five, and uh, that, that was the end of it. Uh, I've got to a point now where even though I was rarely sick, Rarely sick. I, I've been struck by a condition that is that of the elderly. I'm 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 legally blind. I can't I, I can't. I had a stroke about three years ago, on Columbus Day, and I went to the hospital, and I started complaining about the darkness in the room. And the nurses, you know, would be very kind. They treated me well. Finally, they came in and said, well, Dr. Ash, the reason why you can't see, you're blind. Well, you can imagine how it felt to have been someone who 
could do. I thought he could do everything and, and overcome everything, who, who made his living reading. And all of a sudden, he had somebody tell you you're blind. That, that was a notion, more than a notion. Well, I said, well, if I'm blind, so be it. Well, what happened is, the, is that, is I think it's kind of interesting, I have what they call a spiritual eye. What a spiritual eye is that it gives you the ability to detect evil and meanness in people. So much so that in, in my church, there are certain people that walk past me, and they touch me, it's like an electric shock. And it scares me sometimes because I'm not sure that I'm just doing this in the part of that, but it's the truth. Some people just are just mean. And I have the ability to detect, detect that meanness in their part of it. So all in all, I, I, I take my blindness as being something that, uh, that is, is that I can't do anything about. Uh, my, my constant prayer is that you know, I, ask, I ask God to give me this, the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. I can't change my blindness. I have to accept it as a part of it. So being blind is, to me is a, is a, is, is David being a, 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 a disability to me, it's, it's a badge of courage. Well, I, I tell you what, I used to, uh, as a part of my, my responsibility to the IRB, uh, I, would, I would attend uh, prima meetings. And one year, uh, uh, I got a call from, 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 uh, from, from, from Bill Freeman asking me to serve on a panel discussion. And, and at, at, at IRB at a prima meeting to discuss uh, whether Tuskegee could happen again. So I I, I agreed to do it, and so uh, we we had a pa had a panel. Bill was on the panel. Uh, a woman named Donna Clay, who was the uh, administrative assistant to IRB, another panelist, and and a third man was there. And what we talked about, whether something like Tuskegee could, could recur. And, uh, and you know, we, we went through a whole discussion about it because I believe that, uh, that, uh, that, that based upon my understanding of human nature, that Tuskegee can, can happen again. So I said something like uh, that, uh, that that I believe Tuskegee can happen again because it's like a, like a leopard. A leopard doesn't change its spot. It kind of fades into the woodwork. And then when it comes out, it attacks the, the innocent animals around it different that way. Well, that, that was not something original for me. It's something that I, I had read by a man named Kelly Miller, who, who my father, admired, mainly because of the fact that Keller Miller became the first African-American to attend Johns Hopkins University to work on a PhD in mathematics. Uh, Keller Miller didn't, didn't graduate because when the, when the stock market fell and, and John, John Hopkins lost his, his wealth, he canceled all, his, all the scholarships he had. The other reason was that Keller Miller was one of the few people that recorded the history of the contributions of African Americans in the First World War. Uh, so when I was born, my father named me Warren Kelly Ash. I was named after Warren G. Hardy, who most people don't remember his being a president because he, 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 he was a womanizer. Hardy was a very handsome man. He, in fact, he looked like he might have been black. He was a senator from, from, from Ohio. So when I was born in 1929, uh, my father named me Warren, after Warren G. Hardy, Kelly, after Keller Miller, Ash. And he always told me that 
wherever you go, you're not Warren Ash, you are Warren Kelly Ash. So I said, well, if my daddy wants me to do that, that's fine. That's, I'll, 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 I'll be Warren Kelly. And when I was growing up, my mother, uh, I knew she was mad with me. She called me Warren Kelly. I knew that she was really ticked off. Most of the time, they called me something else. My older brother gave me a nickname that I don't understand yet why he did it. He started calling me CB. So all growing up, you know, if I go back to my, my old neighborhood and somebody said, hey, CB, I know that I, they know me from way back because, it, because that, that's what it was. But my mother always referred to me as Warren, as Warren Keller. She would uh, use both, both names as a part of it. Uh, my mom was a, uh, a, a praying woman. She, uh, she had, uh, had, they had, had, as I said before, three sons. I was a, the middle, middle child. And they used to pray for me. And when I, was, I was growing up, you know, to become something more than that. When I got my PhD, my mother got sick. And uh, it, it, I, I never believed that hap happiness would make somebody sick. But the doctor asked me, so the doctor asked you, what, what has happened to have her diverticulum? It just quivered. And She never said what it was, but she had diverticulitis. And, and, uh, and she was just so happy in the fact that I had finally gotten my PhD as a part of that. But, uh, but she was a wise woman from the standpoint that she never called me Dr. Ash. Uh, she always tell people that she had three sons, Willie, Albert, and Warren Kelly, and they and people will say, "Well, what about the one that's a doctor?" Oh, oh, you mean oh, you mean Warren Kelly? She wouldn't, wouldn't she never addressed me personally as Doctor Ash until the night before she died, and uh, that night uh, she had uh, her legs had swollen up real bad, and I had rubbed the legs to and make it make it feel better. And so I said, well, Mom, is that, uh, how does that feel? She said, uh, that feels good, son. I said, you okay? She said, yeah. I said, well, okay, I'm, I'm glad you do. She said, well, I'm okay now because my doctor's here now. And I said, Mom, nobody's here but you and me. And her response was that I had always been her doctor. That was the only time she ever addressed me as Dr. Ash. And I, I, I thank her for the fact that she, at least she, she lived long enough to, to realize that uh, ha having a PhD is not just something that just happens. It, it's, it's, it's a struggle that you go through to accomplish it. Uh, I, I think I, I told my wife, you know, at least I used to, used to don't tell anything more about that, but not much I can tell her. But she, she heard most of this, uh, that, uh, that I wanted a PhD. It's not something that I needed, but it's something I wanted. And I decided at that time that if that's what I want, I need to pay the price to pursue it. When I received my PhD, it was it was the uh, the commencement was held in the in the, the stadium of Howard University, and the chairman of the board of trustees, Geraldine Pittman Woods, uh, was one of the people that got up and congratulated me on this, and I was the last one to be. Granted the PA that PhD that way, and the interesting thing about it is that how commencements are interesting. Uh, you have to really attend one 
to realize how much of, of, of importance Howard is to the black community. Everybody wants to be a part of Howard University, whether they went to Howard or not, they would be there. And what my experience was that, he, that Howard, they said, never rained on Howard's commencement. Well, that was true until I got my bachelor's. When I got my bachelor's, it, it rained three days, the whole campus was flooded, so we had to go to a, to a white high school to have, have my commencement. When I got my master's, it rained. When I got my PhD, it rained. Oh, no. oh. So it turned out that when I, the only time it did rain was when I got my second master's in, in divinity. That, that was a sunny day. And I think since then, I have not been back to school since then. One of the experiences I had you know, by attending, you know, going to schools I did, is I made friends with students. Uh, I, I took a class in, in, uh, in pathogenic microbiology from a, 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 a man named Dr. Smith. So I walked in the class, I had an agreement with him, I would never ask him a question if he never referred to me as Dean Ash. And he said, oh, that'd be fine. You know, he was a very, very, very nice you know, old, old man. And, uh, and so we went through the whole semester, and I would listen to him lecture. And then finally, we got to, got to some point in the class. He said to, to the class that we have an expert in this class on herpes simplex. Dr. Dean Ash is an expert on herpes simplex. I said, oh, my God, he's going to do it now. Well... I thought that would pass by. Well, we went to, went to the lab that night, and a, a young woman from, from, from Philadelphia named Selma Jackson came to, to my desk where I was and said to me, he said, uh, Dr. Smith called somebody Dean Ash tonight. Is that you? I said, yeah. She said, well, is Dean, is Dean your title or, or your name? I said, well, it's, a, it's, it's my title. Well, I thought that would satisfy her. And she went back to her desk and, and went on. So about two nights later, same little lady comes back to my desk and said, you know something, if I was a dean, I'd be damn if I'd be in this class. I said, I'll tell you what, if you have desire, I have, you will be in this class. It turned out that, uh, that everybody knew I was a dean so I never had to stand in line to get registered because they would say, Dean Ash is back there. They would, that would pass, they would pass my papers up, man, and I would get registered in front of everybody else. I made more friends as a student than I could have ever, ever imagined. And it was almost like the, 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 that, that they thought it was some, some, like, like it was some kind of, almost like, you know, hero worship. They said, this, they said, this man, who was in his 60s working on a PhD is willing to get in line with me. They thought it was, it was something of a respect. I didn't get my PhD until I was late in life. I had, uh, I was, I think, 54, I think it was when I got it. And, uh, and I got my last degree, a Master's of, of Arts in Religious Studies when I was, when I was, I think that I think that that was the last one. I was I, I don't I get my years mixed up. I don't know how old I am really. <laughs> they, they tell me I'm 84. I, I'm, I'm not sure, but uh, but I know I know when I was born. That was the important thing. But you know, well, Prima is uh, has been. I I uh, you know I went I took part in, in that in that panel discussion I was telling you about with Bill and other people. And, uh, and Bill, of course, nominated me for the Prima Board. And I had, uh, had, met, had met Joan before then, but, uh, but you know, she, she, she just thought I was just, one, just somebody attend, attend, attending Prima meetings. When Bill nominated me, nominated me for the board, you know, uh, they, they, the, the, the board director ele elected me. So uh, I would leave Washington in, in the in early in the morning. They met on Saturday. 
And I would go to BWI, Marshall, in, in outside of Baltimore, catch a plane, fly to Boston to get here by 9.30 in time for the board meeting. Then when the board meeting was over, I would go back, you know, back the same way. Well, well my, my first meeting was, was monumental because I walked in the room and I had got choked up. And I always believed, and my father always told me, that as a professional, you dress like a professional. He always told me I cannot afford to wear jeans or wear a, 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 wear a player shirt. And, and, and he, he, was, he was a neat little man who always wore a white shirt. Even though he was, he, he, he was a painter, he dressed like, a, like, like, he, like he owned money. But he, but he didn't. So, so I, I got dressed up in that, that, first, that first meeting and flew, flew, flew to Boston, man, for the first meeting. I walked in the first meeting and here this room full of white men, no white women, just white men, and I was the only one that had a suit on. Man, I, I said, man, this is something. I really messed up, man. They, they got me on, on this board. And, and, and I told them, I said, the thing about it is that you got me and what you got is what you're going to deal with. Uh, and I let them know that, that, first of all, there's nobody in this room that looks like me. And I think it was Charlie McCarthy who said, well, Warren, there's not many people in the world that look like you in a way, so why, why do you say that? <laughs> Charlie had a way of, of diffusing every situation, you might say. So, uh, so the, that, that was my beginning on the Prima Board. Uh, I, I've seen Prima grow, you know, from the early meetings to the point, you know, where it, it largely is right now. Uh, Bill, Bill and I wrote a, uh, a, 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 a program for them to, to involve more minority institutions in Prima activities. And the Prima board adopted it and, and Prima funded it. So, they, so part of this meeting was having these, these international scholars come to, to attend Prima meetings. The idea was to, because not, not many minority institutions sit IRB, IRBs to have Prima meetings, we'll, we'll try to find some way to encourage their participation, their participation. And by doing that, we thought that this would be some way to encourage more minorities to attend. I guess we achieved something by doing it because it was uh, it's still going on now. It's going to become an international thing to include uh, international IRBs as well as uh, like I said next year they say it's going to include IACCUC animal animal care committees going to be be invited to attend too. Uh, uh, Prima has been a, a major part of you know you know of of, of, of my professional life. Uh, Joan has been a remarkably talented young woman. Uh, I have the highest regard for her because of what she has done you know, with Prima. Uh, most people didn't know that Joan was a lawyer and that she uh, finished law school and this was her first job. And she has maintained it for all this time. B Bill Freeman is, uh, is one of the people that I have a lot of respect for because of the fact that what he's done, uh, he, has, he, he, is a, he was a public health service officer and he has worked with the, the tribal nations to help them get, get in compliance too with human research along with that. And in and, and every meeting I attend, I look for Bill. Because I depend upon him, you know, to to guide me, to let me know if I'm going in the right direction. Uh, he he never changed over all these years. The part of that. Another one I want to highlight is being unflappable is Charlie McCarthy. Charlie is one of these people that uh, that is gentle in his in his presentation, always willing to to negotiate. But never taking a hard stand that's inflexible. Uh, he has been, I think, a, a, a close colleague and a confidant of all these years. 
I always felt as though that if I had Charlie on my side, that I, I would be all right. I think that Prima ha, ha, has, a, has a bright future. Uh, the, the best is yet to come. I, I'm concerned by virtue of the fact that, uh, that, that Joan is retiring and, and no successor has, has, has been named. Uh, I was hoping that, uh, that you know, without you know, revealing your personal preferences, that Kimberly would, uh, would apply for the position. But Kimberly has, has advised me that she's not interested. So my question is, and my question to, to Prima would be that, have you formed a search committee? And if so, when you, will their report come to, to, to replace Joan? Uh, Joan it cannot be replaced. I think she's irreplaceable in, in, this, in, in this portion of our society. You don't quite often find somebody who is so committed and so into what she's working on that it becomes like it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a, like a missionary work that she worked with. It. She's never taken this as being just a position. She's taken it from the standpoint of being a calling. This is what she has been called to do. And like most good people, she had answered the call and done well. Uh, I'm glad to have been a part of this in the short period of time along, along with it. Uh, I think I'm a part of the history too because some things have occurred uh, in, in the board meetings that I was a part of that, uh, that, that people tell me that, uh, that most people would have just kept quiet. I, I wanted to know when I first joined the board, you know, why is that there are no black people on the board? Well, why is it just me? Well, it's because the fact that, uh, that they were selective and who they nominated to be on the board. Nobody, anybody could just be on the board. You had to show that you were, you were qualified and could make a contribution to it. And I, I, I appreciate their confidence in, in, in me to recognize the fact I had those kind of kinds of qualities that would help me serve well. Uh, beyond that, I can't say. I, I think that, uh, that Prima has a, has, has a real hard job to do to find a replacement equal to what Joan has given to it. And, and, and that, that's, that's my concern. I'm glad of one thing. I'm glad I'm not on the board no more. <laughs> I don't have to take part in those deliberations because uh, and I mean that facetiously because I, I do wish I could still attend board meetings, but but I can't. There's no point in, in trying to fool myself that uh, that that a, a, a one-eyed man is king in the, in, in, in the world of the blind. A blind man is just blind. That's all. <laughs> and, and that's and that's something that that's a part of it. I I I look at the at, at, I've taken my blindness as being. I pray constantly, not so much for the, the, my sight to come back, but, but let me live my life to the best I can. And let me come to the end of my journey. And I can say truthfully to, to anybody that I have not wounded any souls. I have not taken advantage of anyone. And the reason why I've done that because I live by what I believe is right, not what other people think should be right. And I try to be true to that. Unfortunately, what happens to you when you uh, uh, have that position, people take advantage of you. And uh, I understand that too. But again, that's their problem. There's a song that uh, sung in, in, in my church. I used to hear it when I was a boy in the country. A man named Singing Sam the Barbasol Man was the name of he would he would come on in the middle of the day and sing this song. And his and the song would be if I have wounded if I 
any any souls today, if I have put one foot to go astray, if I walk in my own willful way, dear Lord, forgive. That's called the evening prayer. It's one of the hymns in in uh, in, in my, my my the hymnal of my church, uh, and that that's my constant you know, prayer that uh, that I can wind my life up and can say honestly before I go before the Almighty that I have not moved in this soul. That I'm not taking anything from anybody or, or, or done something that was displeasing in his sight because finally he will be the judge of all of us as to whether we are worthy of the kingdom or just thrown aside. I, I think that, uh, that the, the by and large, uh, if I can wind this up, that, that I appreciate your time and, and, what, you, and what, what you're doing for this. I understand, I've heard your story and I felt your pain and what you've had to deal with in your own family. But all I can tell you is that in the final analysis, the final analysis, all the things that have happened to you have made you a stronger person. Because I can feel your goodness. So I appreciate your taking the time to hear all this rambling from, <laughs> you know, from, uh, this was supposed to be an hour and a half interview, you know, I'm told. Uh, my my daughter said, "Well, Daddy, she doesn't know what she's in for." <laughs> because what what happens that uh, that that it's because I've had so many experiences. I want to share them with everybody I possibly can. Uh, some people may think that that's just just an, an old black guy just talking, but believe me, it's not that is that I want to leave a legacy behind me that people know that Warren Kelly Ash had been here.